Zoom window, let us know where you're calling in from. I can see lots of people with names and where they're calling in from. Uh, again, just keep yourself on uh, mute. Um, any questions, please drop them in the chat box on the side and we'll pick them up at the end of the meeting today in the last 10 to 15 minutes. And um, also, if, if you can turn your camera on, we'd love you to. We'd love to see everyone's faces and, you know, it's a it's a big fight, this one. <laughs> it's, it's great just to see faces and to know that there's a lot of people out there supporting everyone. Just quickly jumping over to the agenda today, um, I would like to introduce you to Erin Farley, our Head of um, Campaigns. Hey, Erin. And um, also- G'day. Apologies, just everyone saw me going, running down my stairs when my internet dropped out. So now I'm calling from Wurundjeri land and downstairs closer to my Wi-Fi. So thanks for that. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Erin. And we've also got Andrew Hunter, who is our um, conservation campaigner on the camp campaigns team. I'm Fiona Blanford. I'm a community organiser at um, Bird Life Australia. So um, I'm going to hand you over to Andrew in a minute. He's going to update you on our nature laws campaign, um, the EPPC review and um, the government response. Erin's going to jump in and update us on the Senate inquiry um, and what the process has been there and also um, the submission. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about integrating your um, story into um, the submission. We're going to have a quick breakout. We, um, we'd love you guys just to meet each other, just to say hi and, you know, what some of the issues are in your area. We'll have a bit of question time and, and then we'll um, wrap up and let you know some of the next steps. So um, I'll just hand you over to Aaron. Um, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks, everyone, and uh, welcome. I imagine many of you have been following this campaign uh, for quite a while now. Um, it's been, I guess, almost 10 years now that, that BirdLife Australia has been campaigning for stronger nature laws. Um, and that's really because we've, we've really witnessed firsthand about how, how the current laws and the current system are failing to protect and restore threatened species and the environment. Um, as many of you will know, Australia has one of the worst records in the world for extinctions um, and also for land clearing. Uh, we're on the same level as uh, many of the third world developing countries, which doesn't look great for a you know, leader in the Pacific region. Um, and the, the number of species that are on the threatened species list um, just continues to grow. Um, so we, we know that the status quo is unsustainable. And if we really want to you know, protect and restore these species, then we need real change. And that really comes down to uh, our key piece of national uh, environmental legislation, which is the um, Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act um, or EPBC Act, which was um, introduced and um, signed into law in 1999. And as part of our, I guess, campaign, we've been really building to this critical moment, um, which we knew was coming. And that's around the statutory 10 year review of the EPBC Act. Um, we knew that this was you know, the opportune time for us to influence um, and I guess overhaul our national nature laws. So for the, the last few years, the campaigns team, we've really been focused on this, this key moment and some of the political moments around the statutory review. Um, so in 2017, we, we developed a report highlighting case studies of where we see the current system and current laws failing um, threatened species and specific birds and habitats. Um, if you haven't seen that report, um, you can find it on our actforbirds.org website, but we'll also send a link to everyone um, later today if you just want to catch up on the reading. And that really report just has some case studies of, of again, where we see the current system failing our birds, but also um, demonstrated a pathway forward with some key recommendations that we think um, need to be implemented if we want stronger nature laws and actually um, seed protection and restoration of our threatened species. Um, so after we launched that report, we, we went on a, a few uh, road shows is what we call them, uh, where we toured the country, getting out to capital cities and communities to talk to birdlife supporters and other community members um, to, I guess, first talk about this issue, demonstrate the problem, and also provide tools and uh, ways that everyone can engage in this process, um, specifically around this uh, statutory review, which I've referenced a few times. Um, and really, the I guess our nature laws campaign, it 
the way it fits in our campaigns team, it's, it's the overarching or umbrella campaign for everything we do. And that's really because we know that if we did have stronger laws, then uh, the internationally important Ramsar wetlands that can be found at Tunda Harbor, um, they wouldn't be threatened with destruction from a private real estate project. Um, we know if we had stronger nature laws, then uh, the critical feeding and uh, breeding habitat of a species like swift parrot, which unfortunately, um, whose population is now estimated to be in the hundreds, um, if we had stronger laws, then uh, those critical habitats would actually be protected and wouldn't be allowed to be logged by the native forestry industry. Um, so that's, a, I guess, a bit of a um, snapshot in history of, I guess, BirdLife Australia's organization campaign and how we've got to this moment, um, as I've said a few times, which is the independent review of the EPBC Act. So Fee, can you just go to the next slide? So the, as I was saying before, the EPBC Act, it has to be reviewed every 10 years. Um, and the statutory time for the latest review was um, in 2019. So the, the review kicked off in late 2019. And um, that I guess part of that process include, uh, included submissions and a public comment from the community, from national environmental um, groups like BirdLife Australia and uh, other members of the Places You Love Alliance, which um, is Australia's largest alliance of, um, uh, of national organizations that are um, all campaigning for the same um, goal of, of stronger nature laws. Um, so after that, the review kicked off. I said there was some you know, public comment period. They, there was hearings. There were uh, you know, meetings with uh, business and other in ENGOs. And the independent reviewer um, took all that comments, um, reviewed the EPBC Act and um, came out with an interim report, which basically concluded which um, what we've been speaking about for the, you know, the last 10, 10 years really is that the EPBC Act as it's currently written, um, it's not fit for purpose. It's, it's ineffective, it's unsustainable and it doesn't, it's not um, adaptive enough to address current, even future threats, including climate change. Uh, the report also highlighted uh, many of the key issues that we have demonstrated in our, our reporting and other ENGOs have demonstrated, and that's the failure for the EPBC Act to prevent and address cumulative impacts. So this is, um, I guess, when you hear uh, groups talking about death by a thousand cuts, that's what we mean, cumulative impacts. If you uh, destroy one piece of habitat, um, in a piecemeal fashion, it'll eventually build up until there is a significant impact on the species. And the current APBC Act does not account for those cumulative impacts. Um, there's poor coordination of environmental data um, to measure both the impact of projects and outcomes of species. Um, and also the APBC Act really fails to implement recovery efforts for threatened species. So if a species is, species is listed as threatened, endangered, or critically endangered on the EPBC Act. Um, there, it doesn't do enough to actually implement recovery plans and conservation advices to get that species downlisted on the EPBC, EPBC Act and ultimately off the Act um, altogether. The report also presented about, I think it was 38 recommendations, Aaron. Um, if I'm wrong, correct me. But I guess two, two of the recommendations that we wanted to, I guess, focus on today um, are the establishment of an independent regulator or a, a tough, tough cop on the beat. Um, and this regulator would provide that critical independence oversight to ensure that uh, the EPBC is complying, I mean, I guess, to ensure that um, proponents and um, you know, other actors are complying with the current environmental laws. Um, and also establishing national environmental standards that must be legally enforceable and have clear and measurable outcomes. And these two recommendations were uh, similar to recommendations that we have um, presented in our reporting. So we were happy with that. Um, obviously, we, we think there, there is room for improvements, um, but unfortunately, after this interim report was released late last year, uh, the government, um, the current government, uh, immediately came out and rolled out uh, an independent re regulator and it moved to uh, shift its national oversight or its responsibility for uh, assessments and approval processes away from the co Commonwealth and to the states. 
Um, so I might just jump to the next slide, please, Bing. And that's, um, that was the first, I guess, amendment bill that was um, introduced in Parliament late last year. Um, and that was the EPBC Amendment Streamlining Environmental Approval Bill. Um, and I'll hand it over to Aaron in just a minute. But that, that bill is basically, as I was saying, um, default devolving decision-making away from the Commonwealth government to the states and territories. Uh, the bill was introduced without those strong enforceable environmental standards, which was a recommendation from the independent review report and also from BirdLife Australia and other national ENGOs. Um, and it was uh, introduced before the final report of the, of the review was even released to the public. And, and we were very concerned um, with this initial amendment bill because we, again, know firsthand about how risky it can be for the um, Commonwealth government to hand off its oversight and um, compliance, I guess, mechanisms. And that's really through regional forestry agreements where we've seen um, you know, state governments can um, log and destroy habitat for critically endangered species like uh, swift parrot and have, there's no national oversight in that process. So I might just hand over to Aaron to talk a little bit more about this bill and the politics surrounding um, uh, I guess, where it went from there. So, hand over to Aaron. Great. Thanks, Andrew. And, um, yeah, thanks um, for that overview. So, obviously, um, the campaign to improve nature laws in Australia has been going for a long time. Um, and as Andrew set out, we're, um, we're really in a pretty critical period now. So I think um, one of our colleagues from another environment group called it the, um, you know, we're coming up to the fourth quarter um, uh, to use um, some AFL um, language. Some of you are from, um, from rugby, um, rugby uh, states. So um, whatever you're sporting or other, other, um, uh, uh, other word for it would be we're, we're coming up to a really critical um, time. Um, and I guess the, there's, we can look at that in two ways. So one is um, we're in a real, um, you know, things could go either way. Um, there's a real moment where we could, um, <laughs> yes, Brisbane Lions, um, where we could, things, things could go awry, but we're also still in the middle of a real window of opportunity. So as Andrew said, we've, um, last year we had the independent review of the EPBC Act um, that gave us a, a not perfect, but a pretty good set of recommendations from um, a very credible independent review of Professor Graham Samuel. Um, the government did not respond. Um, they haven't ever really completely responded to that review. They moved ahead already. There was, you know, and we know that they already had plans to, put in place legislation to hand off those powers to the states, um, which would give us um, laws, uh, would weaken laws and, and um, not stop the extinction crisis, which is really what we, we need to do with our environmental laws. Um, luckily last year, um, we were able to stop those laws from getting voted on. And, and that was really largely because of a lot of pressure exerted by people like yourselves all over the country. So this, bad bill was introduced into parliament um, and then um, Fee if you wouldn't mind um, going to the next slide um, we were able to stop that bill from being voted on there was a senate inquiry 22,000 people put in a submission in the space of about five days and we know um, thousands from bird life um, but thousands of bird life supporters did that as well so um, it was just a real show of um, concern and strength from um, people who care about the environment all over the country. Um, so that kind of brings us to here. So what's happened um, since, I guess, the last time we spoke to you and, and that big um, push at the end of last year is the Environment Minister has introduced another set of bills. So these bills sound kind of good, but they're not. So what we've got now is the Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Amendment Standards and Assurance Bill. So what that does um, is it puts in place, um, the government did it, I guess, in response to the crossbenchers demands um, for um, a better response to Professor Graham Samuel's review and report. 
um, and policing out if any of this is getting too technical. There's a lot of detail. I know a lot of you have been along um, on this journey for a long time though. So we thought it was worth kind of going into things in a little bit more detail. But essentially this bill is in, was in response to the crossbenchers demands and, um, but it really didn't go far enough. So um, it, put in, it, it put in place um, national environmental standards which are no better than the current EPBC Act, which we know is not protecting um, our wildlife. So um, it would not do anything to improve the state of the environment. Um, and when coupled with the um, handoff of powers to the states, we'd see that go backwards. It also put in place um, structure for an assurance commissioner, um, which doesn't doesn't have any teeth, any staff or ability to audit um, projects individually. So things like Atunda Harbour, um, which a lot of you will be familiar with, um, it's a really dodgy proposal to build a block of apartments on Ramsar wetland. Um, that would not be able to be assessed by this commissioner. So it's not great. It's not what we were looking for. But what it does do is it sets up a framework that we can improve on. And that's why the next few months are so important. So this bill, the Standards and Assurance Bill is now um, part of a Senate inquiry. Um, Sophie, if you can um, take us to the next slide. So it's now part of this Senate inquiry where we get the opportunity to try to um, get uh, ex really examine the issues again and try to, using this inquiry, develop a set of legislation that will deliver at least some gains for the environment, hopefully a lot more. Um, so it's not what we want now, but it gives us the foundation to try and make something better, which the first bill, the devolution um, or handoff to the um, states bill did not do. That was a, just a complete step backwards. This gives us the framework for something that we can move forward on um, and extends the window of opportunity to get something good um, from this EPBC review process. So um, if you can um, take us to the next slide, Fee. Um, now we've got some animations. You might have to keep clicking. Thank you. <laughs> um, so right now we're in the Senate inquiry period. So what we really want to do is use this Senate inquiry to try to um, give us the best chance of getting amendments to the proposed bill that give us a good set of laws. Um, and then just to situate this in, in where we're at and um, you know how the, the last two quarters of, um, of the game are going to go. We've got the Senate inquiry. There's a deadline of March 25. And one of the main things that we want you all to do after this webinar um, is go away and write um, a submission to the Senate inquiry that talks about why stronger nature laws are important to you. So we've been talking about a fair bit of technical jargon. That's not really necessary for the submissions from you. The thing that we want the um, Senate committee um, to see is why these, um, why protecting our environment is important to Australians of all walks of life from all over the country. And it's so fantastic to see so many people from different parts of the country here today, because we really want to emphasize to the entire parliament why it's so important. And that's going to be really um, critical to the next stage of our strategy, which will be keeping the pressure up with meetings um, with MPs. Um, especially in some really key electorates. So we know a lot of you have already met with your MP. Um, we've been having fantastic um, feedback from folk who've been setting, writing, contacting their local MP, setting up meetings, meeting with them. Um, you might have seen we shared on our social media feed um, earlier this week um, the Hastings Birdwatcher group who found themselves having a meeting with the um, Federal Environment Minister um, who had just happened to drop in on the meeting that they'd organised with um, their local MP, Pat Conaghan. Um, that is so amazing and it really demonstrates the power of bird life and bird watching groups. Um, I know that the, the feedback that we got from that meeting was that the Environment Minister was happy to drop in on that meeting because she sees bird watching groups and bird life groups as a credible um, source of and gauge of what the community is feeling. Um, she sees people like yourselves as like real environment community representatives. 
So um, that's a really amazing thing for us that, um, you know, we're viewed like that and that your voice is so powerful when you do have those meetings with your MPs. So we want to keep that pressure up. We want to get through the key messages to MPs in some really key electorates, which we can share some more information about later, but we're wanting to really pressure some of those coalition MPs. If you're in a Labor MP's seat though, that's still important because um, they're still going to need to negotiate with the government to try and get the right laws. And then we think that um, we're probably going to be hitting the campaign peak sometime after June. So submissions for the Senate inquiry are due on the 25th of March. So that's the end of next week. We don't have a lot of time. Um, and then the, the, um, there'll be hearings and then the committee um, will report from the Senate inquiry in June. And then when parliament resumes, we are expecting that there'll be some kind of um, vote on some form of the bill. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know if it's going to be something we want MPs to vote for or against yet. That's our task in the next couple of months. So that's kind of where we're at now. Um, Sophie, if you want to take us to the next slide. Um, this is what we want you to do first is to write a submission to the Senate inquiry. Um, so I might just hand over to Fee to chat a little bit about how we can try and make your um, submissions as powerful as possible. Great, thank you, Erin. So something that we've been using in the last um, probably two to three years, uh, especially going back to our forums where we traveled around the country and met many of you face to face. Um, a part of that was um, trying to find some of the, the leaders in the, in the community um, to work with them on their stories as a way of telling their own stories and talking about their own connections um, to actually kind of, I guess, bring more people into the campaign, but just to really convey um, that this is a, there's a real personal connection here. This is something that um, the Senate um, committee really want to hear about. They really want to hear about what, how this affects you locally and your community locally. Sorry, I can hear somebody on, um, oh, I'm just going to press the mute message there. Um, so how we look at it, um, there's a structure that we use. It's a structure that um, was formed by a guy called Marshall Gans. He basically was on the Obama campaign and he was, um, you know, a lot of people say was responsible for helping him um, win, win his presidency. Really just a structure on how to talk about yourself and how to break that down in a bit of a um, challenge choice outcome. But just quickly here for a minute, so story of self, talk a bit about um, obviously yourself, what's motivated you to care about stronger nature laws, make sure to bring in the us factor, which is talking about your community, um, who are you working with, um, a, a, even if it's, you know, your family, like there's a, many ways to kind of, you know, think about community and what you're working on, what your local patch is and, and you know, what you're kind of afraid of seeing. Um, and then obviously a way forward. Um, in the submission that we're gonna, um, guidelines that we'll send you after today, there's a little bit in there. That's some, uh, a summary from EDO on both the standards and also um, that insurance, insurance bill that Erin um, mentioned. So just jumping to the next slide. Um, so I guess like, I reckon you're all fantastic storytellers. So sorry if I'm telling you how to suck eggs here, but I'm just gonna go for the sake of like, you know, um, going through the, the process. Think about your story with the plot and um, think that you're the character who has been challenged. Um, think that it's something that you have to, the challenge makes you pay attention, then you have to make a choice. And it's a choice that you're unprepared for actually, um, but then that choice yields, yields an outcome and from that outcome, um, it teaches a moral. And in this case, it's just morally wrong to let birds in their forests and all species die when we know that something can be done about it. So just as an example there, how the story self, um, the story itself is broken down. As I just mentioned before, start with the challenge. Um, why is what's the challenge in your life that makes you care about nature laws? Why is it challenging? Why is it your challenge? And then, then it became a choice. Like you either joined a group, you found people in your community, you know, you started talking to your family. Where did you get that courage from? Did that come from your family? Um, that your history. Maybe you grew up in a, you know, lots of you are probably from regional areas. There are patches of bushes near you. You holidayed in a certain part of the country. You, you were born there. So there's a real affiliation. Um, you've, you've noticed the, the, the patch declining. Um, you've noticed that the birds aren't there anymore. Just like really like to the heart. Like they really want to hear from the heart here of yourself and your community. And then um, what the outcome was there. You know, what did that teach you? Again, you formed a group of people. You all, you were passionate together. Um, I think for me and my story of self, it was something like, I feel like I, I just couldn't stand by and watch this happen anymore. 
I had to do something about it. I had to get the tools to be able to do something about the injustice that was happening in my life. So just a really quick, this is like a full day kind of like workshop I've just given you in like, you know, a couple of minutes. We'll follow up with the, um, you know, some guidelines. It's just a couple of pages. It also in, um, has a story from one of our leaders, Rosemary Jasper, who was working in Perth on the Black Carnaby Cockatoo campaign over there from Kokana Rup. Um, she just talked about moving to this community and then, you know, this beautiful patch right on her neighbouring property just was going to be logged for a lithium mine. So for her, you know, she, um, you know, made some new friends, made a you know action group in her community, and the fight continued. So there's an example story there for you to have a look at. Sorry if I'm talking too fast. Seems to be one of my things. I've got to slow down a bit. So just jumping to the next slide, um, we're going to put you in a breakout with probably like um, about three people, just for about ten minutes. Um, just to kind of, there's a couple of prompting questions there. What's happening in your community? Um, why do you care about stronger nature laws? And why you can't stand by and let this happen? I know many of you have been in the fight and stuff for a very long time. Don't feel like you need to answer all of those questions. Maybe just pick one, even just where you're calling in from, what's happening in your area. Um, I think we, I think it's just really important for us and um, that all of you get to meet each other. Um, well, it's the, the two other people in your group anyway, because we'll, we'll be doing this again. So, Andrew, um, if you're ready, uh, has anyone got any questions? Um, let's in the chat. Did I miss anything? Oh, oh, oh. No, everyone, that's pretty good. Fiona. Um, Hi. Is, uh, it's Mick here from uh, Yapoon from Cap BirdLife Capricornia. Mm -hmm. Has there been any studies done that show the um, the health benefits for for um, for being in the environment and stuff like that? That's a really interesting question. We just um, uh, heard from our RSPB um, bird partners in the UK. Actually, they were talking about how doctors over there are recommend are subscribing nature um, for mental health. So that's a really good pickup. That's um, something that um, I've put in the notes in the submission guidelines, actually, that if you are concerned about the mental health of your community, that is absolutely something you should be putting in this submission. Did you want to add anything to that, Erin? No, but I know that um, doctors for the environment are probably putting in a submission as well. Um, they were on a hookup that I was on this morning, actually about a, a different Senate inquiry about an RFA amendment um, bill, which um, happy to chat to folk about, but we don't need to talk about it right now. Um, but yeah, they will be. And, and it's for that reason that um, when the environment is destroyed, um, people get sick um, and... Um, I think if you want to, um, you can reference information about that, but probably just as powerful would be um, anecdotes or evidence that you see in your own community of um, the impact of environmental degradation. If you're from a bushfire affected community, what happened? How did people feel? Um, you know, what are the changes that you see, um, you know, around your own lives from um, when nature is, um, is destroyed? Great, thanks, Sarah. So um, we might just put you in breakouts and then we'll come back and um, we'll continue this conversation. I think there's, there's lots to talk about here. I noticed someone just put something in there about forest baiting. I'd, I'd be keen to hear more about that also. So Andrew, do you want to hit, hit the button and uh, we'll see you guys in 10 minutes. Thanks so much. Do we have someone in a room there on their own, on, in room four? Or is that just, oh no. They're just slowly trickling so in. So everyone online, you should have got an invite. If you just... Oh yeah, there you go, excellent. Maybe we'll just, can we give them one more minute? I wonder if we need to put um, just those questions. I might put those questions. Um. Um. 
Can one of you grab those? Because I've got I'm screen sharing. I can't grab those questions out of the. Um, yes, yeah, okay. There's still a few people that haven't joined a group. Um, I think we can. You can probably just assign them to those two groups. Yep, I'm trying to get to that point. So that's okay. That's all right. I'll jump. Um. Hey, Erin. She went into a group. I just see. Okay. All right. I might just jump over here. For everyone online, um, are you able to join your group or did you get a message? Hmm. Sorry, Faye. That's okay, don't worry. I'm gonna move Vicky into a group of two. You can probably just leave people mostly where they are. I think it's fine. Yeah, uh, there's one. Uh, Vicky was in a room by herself. Oh, on her own. Okay, cool. Yeah. And Ian as well. So I'll just move him. I can actually put um, a few people in in rooms also. Actually, I'm unable to put people in rooms. I can just put people in a waiting room. So that's okay. I think we can, um, maybe some folks here that just don't want to join. It's completely fine if people don't want to that's join. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Do you want me to jump in a room, maybe? Yeah, if you want to, is there any room? Maybe jump in um, one, maybe this one, Mick Barker. Someone hasn't joined a room. I might, I might even move John to, um, Room 14. Yep. Yeah. Cool. I'm sorry, I wasn't sure how to add an extra minute. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I think when it gets close to the end, who's this Elizabeth? Someone's in the waiting room. Sorry. Hi, Liz. I can see you've just joined the meeting. We've just got people in um, uh, breakouts for a couple of minutes, just um, introducing themselves and having a bit of a chat around their, in their area. Um, so if you just want to hold on for a second, we can add you to a um, meeting room if you like. Hi. 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 How are you going? Um, hang on. Now... Um, my microphone wasn't working on the other computer. I was in breakout room six. Do you want to see oh, me? Really? <laughs> Did you jump out? Yeah, because my mic wasn't working, so I've changed. Oh, no. oh, that's okay. We can have a chat with you. How are you going? Where are you calling yeah. in from? Good, good. Um, from Dean's Marsh. I'm with Doctors for the Environment Australia as well, so oh. thanks for the plug before. That's great. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Where so just, you, sorry, what area are you in again? The Dean's Marsh at the eastern end of the Otways. Oh, excellent. Yeah. What's what's happening down there? Well, unfortunately, Viva Energy is proposing a gas import terminal now, just adjacent to the Ramsar wetlands mm. in Geelong. And we've just heard there's a second gas import terminal um, uh, in the pipeline for actually inside the Ramsar wetlands. You know, the ones at the Werribee treatment yeah. plant? Yeah, yeah, we're familiar, familiar with that one too. Um, our team works, yeah, obviously very closely there at Werribee. It's our Shorebirds team. They've been watching that. Do you know, has that progressed any further, that proposal? I've only seen one article in the Geelong ad Advertiser mm -hmm. about it. There's nothing on the, the company's website about it. So, yeah. mm. but, um, but that's the problem. If the laws aren't adequate, they can get away with this. Yeah. So um, certainly, like we're waiting for what's happening at Western Port as well. But, yeah. you know, even those protection laws aren't sufficient. So you're, you're with Doctors for the Environment. How did you get involved? In with Doctors for the Environment? Yeah. Are you a um, doctor also? 
Yes, yeah. Um, okay. Back when we were uh, unconventional, ga lock the gate, unconventional gas. So the health impacts of unconventional gas. That's how I got um, kind of involved in the first place. But I'm also a bird watcher. That's why oh, I'm in Australia. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's really great. Yeah. But I think you know what you were saying before about about the um, the need for biodiversity and human health and natural natural spaces. So I've just put a, a link to the biodiversity part of our website up on the chat room. Oh, excellent. Um, okay, I'll raise that in a second. Yeah. Um, I think also, obviously, coming out of like COVID, there's been so much more uh, conversation about you know obviously people using nature as a as a way to ease any kind of mental health pressure and. Mm. Um, and I just I was so impressed to see that you know doctors in the UK. I mean, it's a no-brainer, really, isn't it? It's like go for a walk in nature. But I think well, you immediately like, feel it once you're out there. Like yeah. anyone that goes out and for a bushwalk or bird watching can immediately feels that I guess not sense of calm, but you know a little bit of reassurance and definitely it's good for the soul. They say. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, have you been down in that area? You've lived down there. Mm -hmm. How many years? 20. Oh, mm. 20 years. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty hard to come back to the city, hey? Oh. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, and it's interesting what you said about COVID because so many people in the city are actually spending more time outside as well, working mm. from home. And yeah. I think if there was more knowledge about how destructive these lack of laws are being, um, people would be a bit more upset about it. So, yeah. I know, and that's our that's the constant kind of struggle, isn't it? Is like how do we convey that nature laws are really important to people individually in their communities? Mm. Um, I'm, I'm one of those people who have fled the city. I have a little bungalow, my partner I outside um, a friend's place in um, uh, Inverloch, and um, yeah, people have done it. They've left because they don't want to be in lockdown again. But yeah, it's an opportunity really, isn't it? To say to mm. people, why, why did you leave the city? Like not just for lockdown, but you obviously needed, you know, something else from, from that um, change. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's hard to have the conversation. It's really hard to have the conversation, but we're, we're, we're giving it a good go. Our, um, our birding from home was really successful during COVID. A lot more people were a bit, um, you know, the birds are going crazy. They're doing weird things. It's like, you know, you're just, you just noticing them. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. spring. <laughs> <laughs> you're just noticing them, noticing them do that. So, um, mm. yeah, so no, it's so great to have um, Doctors um, Without Borders on the line. Um, mm. So, Liz, will you be putting in a submission? Will you be helping the, the Doctors for Environment submission or are you just putting in your own personal too? Um, look, I'll probably put a personal, a short personal one in, but um, yeah, with the Catherine Barra -Cloud, Cloud, I don't know if she was at the meeting, but um, but she's been really involved in the biodiversity part of it. So she put a, we put a big submission in for the original, um, the original um, submission. Yeah, she's working on this as well. But. Can I um can I ask you in a couple of seconds when we get out we jump out of school, everyone comes back just to kind of um address Mick's question that he asked before about um maybe how to how doctors um from borders are going to um approach their submission you don't have to give all the details but in the sense of like how it's actually affecting community health human health yeah yeah yep yeah, I can do that mm -hmm. yeah that would be great thank you yeah. thanks for joining us that's all right pleasure. <laughs> I think we're going to get people coming back in in a second. Yep. Yeah. So it says I'll close in a minute. B. I I don't know if we can give another minute. Yeah, I think I think that's okay. We're at one eleven now. I feel like people are probably going to want to have a bit of a discussion yeah. and, and ask a few questions. Um, I called you Doctors Without Borders before. Sorry, Liz, it's Doctors for the Environment. Hi, everybody. How was that? Sorry if that was too short or too long. Um, <laughs> great to get you to um, even just have a bit of a chat with some of the fellow campaigners here. Uh, Andrew and I uh, luckily ended up in a breakout with uh, Liz Bashford from Doctors for the Environment. So, oh, uh, fantastic. Yeah, perfect. But um, Liz was happy to kind of talk to Mick's question uh, when Mick comes back into the main room and probably for everyone on the line just to hear like how, how they're approaching their submission. 
That's great. Actually, I realized after I said that, that it was someone, I think, from the Climate and Health Alliance, not Doctors for the Environment, that I was on the phone with this morning. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're providing submissions for these two amendments, the Forest Agreement and this new one as well. So. Yeah, okay. Yes, as the Senate is keeping us all very busy in the next few weeks. <laughs> yeah. So um, these, we, were, we were just chatting quickly about Nick's question. Um, can you, can you um, yeah, address how communities, how you can incorporate kind of health and mental health in a submission if that's, that's one of your focuses in a community? Um, so I might give a call next to that. Oh, I think I can hear someone, sorry, I can hear someone on mute. Can everyone put themselves on mute? Thanks so much. Sorry, it's such a pain to be asking those questions, but thank you. Oh. oh, thank you, everyone. Mika, are you still here? Yeah, yep, there oh, yep I am. Do you want to ask your question again? Um, so I suppose it comes down to people who aren't interested in environmental stuff and then why we should save nature and why you should be concerned about the environment. And so then to make a reasonable um you know what what why it's a benefit um i was wondering if there were studies done that show how um the environment affects your health and stuff like that so um because i come from an area where the uh, politicians aren't really interested in the environment right. and um so then it's it's like Matt Canavan just says, oh, you know, you can breed a black-throated finch, so why worry about them? So if you can show that the, you know, if, and if we just lose one thing, then, you know, it's only one thing, but then it's about losing more and more things, you know. So what what is the importance of biodiversity, I suppose? And so that's, um, so then if we can show that people using the environment, you know, going camping, having national parks and um, and then farming, you know, even it's even the small things in the um, earth that are important. Yeah. And so that affects, how does that, if, if we can show that um, not having all that stuff around affects um, human health, then it's a, it's a, it adds it to a health issue rather than just an environment issue. Great. Thanks, Mick. Um, I see Steve has his hand up also, but I'll start with Liz. So thanks, thanks, Fiona. Um, uh, hello, everyone. That's a, it's a really good question. Um, everything's interconnected. So all our ecosystems are very complex um, systems where a loss of one species, even though of plant or animal, even though we think it's not much, it actually affects the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing this, that once you start chipping away at ecosystems, the whole system is at risk. And we rely, because we're organic organisms, we rely on the ecosystems um, to live. We rely on, on clean air and clean water um, and a stable food supply and a stable climate to actually to, to thrive as humans. So if we start shipping away at the ecosystems, it actually will have an impact and is having an impact on us already, as we know from, from climate change and um, uh, things like the Murray Dar Dar Darling and the lack of food security up there and water security. And the other thing um, <clears throat> as well is just, as you were saying, just being in, in, in nature, there's a lot of science now to show that um, uh, exercise is good for our health. Um, it's being in nature is good for our mental health. Um, and it's um, it, without those systems, like in urban living, um, unless you have green areas in urban systems, it's it's um, uh, very it, it can be very de detrimental to human health, and it's a uh, issue of equity as well. So um, I put a link up on the chat room. There's quite a bit of science on our website on the Doctors for the Environment website um, uh, relating to, relating to all this, and there's it's worth having a look at that if you're interested in this area to include in the submission. Great, thank you for that, Liz. Thanks so much. Like perfect timing for you to drop in. And I see Peter had his hand up, a hand up to um, maybe add to that. Peter Sainsbury, yeah. Yeah, well, I think Liz has, has covered it. I was just going to say I, I felt obliged to speak as um, 
public health doctor and a past president of the Climate and Health Alliance. Um, but yeah, if you have a look at the um, Doctors of the Environment Australia website or or and whatever the Climate and Health Alliance website, you'll find papers there that talk about the environment and health. Or if you just Google um, being in in the environment and health, or uh, if you Google biophilia, as it's bio, P-H-I-L-A, if, if you just Google those, you'll find references to all that sort of stuff that Mick was, was raising. Um, so yeah, it was just to emphasize that, I don't think it'd be difficult to find some, some, some references quickly just to help you on that issue. Great, thank you, Peter. So just aware of time here and that we only um, wanted to, um, you to share an hour with us today. Um, uh, I think, um, was there any other questions that had popped up in the chat, Erin or Andrew, that you've noticed or anything else um, people want to ask? There's a, uh, 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 something about um, David Atwood's book. Thank you. And um, sorry, sorry, um, Erin. Oh, uh, no, not, not from the chat that I was in, um, but we um, <clears throat> had a good discussion about both the Senate inquiry and then also um, engaging with um, your member of parliament um, and uh, just what, um, else, um, so Carolyn um, was in my group and she um, mentioned she's um, involved in um, the Australian Aviculture Society so she could talk to them about, um, you know, potentially making a representation to somebody. Um, so I guess just, you know, that's something else really um, powerful you can do is connect um, any other groups or memberships or um, you know, communities that you're part of to, to show that, you know, it's not just you on your own, like for every one person who contacts a, um, an MP or puts in a submission, you know, there are a thousand others that um, they represent or that, you know, haven't been able to do it. So, um, yeah, I thought that was a really a great thing that um, Carolyn mentioned she might be able to do. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Hi, Tony. Yeah, hi. I was wondering if you've got any suggestions on the best way of approaching the Senate committee. I mean, is it is it best to go to members of your representatives from your state or or the party or the yeah relevant party? What, what's the best approach? Um, so we'll have a in terms of actually making your submission, we'll have a um, an online tool and a downloadable guide um, that you can use. Um, to make your submission. So we'll be sending around all of those resources after this um, webinar later on this afternoon. Um, the guide will have a few, like a little bit of background on the technical aspects of the bill. But um, as we said, you know, mostly we want people to be sharing your local stories. So I think that's the kind of most important thing. So that tool will send your submission directly to the Senate committee. You can also do it via the Australian Parliament website. So we can um, share that, that, um, that address as well, but we'd love you to use our tool because then we can um, sort of see um, the submissions that people are putting in and how many people have put in a submission, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure. It's Cathy here. Um, is it worthwhile um, writing to our state senators separately as well, not just our local member uh, MP? Um, so in terms of the Senate inquiry, um, the main thing is to do a submission because yeah. that's how that they will consider that. Not yeah, every senator um, is a member of the committee that um, will hear the inquiry. Yeah, but so separate to the inquiry, mm -hmm. is it worthwhile contacting the senators individually of, of your state? Um, look, I, I wouldn't um, tell you not to. Like it's, I think um, the more the better in terms of um, interaction with, um, with parliamentarians. Um, I guess um, the lower house is where... Um, is where political parties tend to gauge um, where the electorate is at. Um, and because the government um, 
it has a working majority, but are not an actual majority in the lower house now. That means um, the House of Representatives is kind of a bit more powerful than the Senate. Where the pe- the the pe- parliamentarians who are powerful in the Senate are the crossbenchers. Um, so I guess um, f- for people for for that, I think if if you live in in South Australia or if you live in Tasmania then I would encourage you to write to um, your crossbench Senate representatives. So um, that would be um, uh, Jackie Lambie and um, Rex Patrick um, and uh, those crossbench senators um, because they they will have a say um, over whether it goes through the Senate. Um, Jackie Lambie will be particularly important. I don't know if there is anybody from Tasmania on the line today. Um, but apart from that, I would be probably focusing your attention on on the lower house. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, if, you, if you've got the time um, and the inclination, go for it, though, mm. so, in terms of contacting senators. Mm-hmm. All right, thanks, Aaron. Anyone got any other questions? Great. Um, so just tapping onto the slide I'm on now, we've already mentioned um, writing and meeting with your, um, continuing that up after you put your submission in and um, that there, yes, there's lots of people online who, are, who have already done this and been some big successes there. Um, just also, um, we've had some success and maybe many of you have also taken your MP out for a bird walk or, or just a nature walk. Like it's actually a much, um, you know, more comfortable environment for, for instead of, you know, over going into the office and also much easier to demonstrate the, um, you know that what's at risk here um, when you've got them out in the bush and looking at birds um, yeah as I say as we say there it's, it's um, a great way to be able to highlight what's at stake in the local area by, by getting them out in the bush now just um, we've had chat time <laughs> so we'll jump to the to the last slide um, some resources that we're going to follow up with today, we'll be sending um, you uh, submission guide guidelines, which we've pulled together with the EDO recommendation uh, summary and also just the story of self um, uh, structure that I, put in, I talked about earlier. Obviously, um, a, a brief, if you're going to be meeting with your MP and you want a brief from us, like we've got briefs for, for many of our campaigns, we can put one together, we can help you um, talk you through some of the you know structure of meeting your MP. We will be sending our BirdLife Advocacy Toolkit that has a quite a detailed description. Um, it is, you know, quite a daunting task um, that, you know, once you actually, you know, go through the toolkit or even sign up for one of our um, workshops that we'll be running on, on meeting your MPs after the submission date, that, um, you know, that would be really helpful for you guys. And what else did I cover everything? Ah, uh, yeah, the storytelling structure. And, you know, please um, get in contact. Um, get in contact with us if you've got any questions. Um, we're here to help um, and, you know, we're here to, you know, be, support you all. And thank you everyone for calling in. It's um, great to see lots of um, familiar faces and um, yeah, please, please stay in touch. Thank you so much. Great, thanks everybody. And yeah, please do get in touch if you have any other questions. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I have a question quickly. Uh, Hey, Brittany, how are you going? Hello. Good, thank you. Um, Cool. Yeah, I think I've e-met some of you. I'm the new conservation advocacy officer for BirdLife Top End. Oh, cool. Oh, hey. Thanks for joining. Good. (laughs) Excellent. Um, so I noticed that this submission is really based um, on members of the public. Um, is there different guidelines for making submissions from a branch? Um, should we make submissions from a branch or is there just going to be one coordinated submission from BirdLife Australia? Mm, that's a really good question. I think there would be one coordinated submission from BirdLife Australia. I'm not sure, Andrew, but what's your advice there? I think if, if the branches are, are willing and keen, absolutely, we can we can share the um, uh, the guidelines and a bit of more of our I guess, organizational uh, submission, which we're still developing. 
Um, so we can help yeah. help with that. It's just more, I guess, like what Aaron was saying, that local context, that's going to be the most powerful. So if you're mm. based in Darwin, I guess, you know, you know, shorebirds and other threatened species outside of mm. Darwin, that would be very helpful. Yeah, yeah, definitely keen to do something with a Darwin focus. Yeah. What's, what's your focus in Darwin? Is it shorebirds mostly? Yeah, we're um, just kind of launching our camp, well, working on identifying our campaigns, but the main one that Amanda um, has been working on is Darwin as a safe haven for shorebirds. So, yeah, yeah we're having a meeting this weekend to discuss our conservation priorities as well. Awesome. That's but great. I was going to bring some of this information there. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've been yeah. It personally. We'll, we'll just connect um, afterwards and we can definitely send you, you'll get this guide um, that we'll be sending everyone, but we can uh, provide a little more background for the, the branch perspective and a little more detail, I guess, that the organization will be putting in our submission. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you all. Yeah. Thank nice you so you. much, everyone. Thanks for hanging around, folks. We'll, we'll catch you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.